I'm reading from uh, Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from them, the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on evil and good. He sends rain on the righteous and, and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Good to be with you again tonight. There is a sermon outline there in quite much detail in the bulletin. As I say, always good to take some notes as we progress through uh, this passage. We're in the Sermon on the Mount again. And tonight we are looking at those verses that Sue uh, read for us just now. A couple of weeks ago, if you were with us, I began in a sermon talking about who are the most influential people in the world today. We call them influencers. And if you're here, you'll know we saw that it was uh, all sorts of pop stars, Justin Bieber, uh, Taylor Swift and all sorts of people like that. And they were considered the most influential people in the world because they had the most followers on social media. Well, today I want us to think about influence again, but in a slightly different way. I want you to think about who do you think are the five most influential people in world history? The five most influential people that you could think of in world history. Could be religious leaders, could be great scientists, could be even some politicians in there. Uh, who would you put in there in your list of the five uh, most influential people in world history? Uh, a couple of years ago, I came across a man called Michael Hart who wrote a book called The 100, a ranking of the 100 most influential people in history. And he explains the criteria which he used in the book was not about who were the best people in history or the greatest people in history, but the most influential people in history. Now, for me, there's no doubt that Jesus Christ is number one. He has to be number one on that list, hands down. I mean, when you think about the influence he's had on our world in so many ways, if you think that today there's something like 2.5 billion followers or people who claim to be Christians in the world, which amounts to you know, 35 to 40 percent of the world's population, you'd have to say, surely he is number one. Well, I was shocked to learn in this book, he's not number one. I couldn't believe it. You'll be even shocked to learn that he doesn't even come in at number two, according to Michael Hart in this book. Jesus Christ comes in at number three. Now, I'm sure you're interested to know who the other ones above him are. Well, number two was Isaac Newton. You'll be interested to know that Paul, you know, Paul who wrote a lot of our New Testament, he came in at number six. That's encouraging. Uh, but according to Michael Hart, number one went to Muhammad, the founder of Islam. He came in first as the most influential person in history. And he came to that conclusion because according to his research... An observation, Muhammad and his teaching has far more influence over the lives of Muslims than Jesus Christ and his teaching has over Christians in their lives. Now, when I stumbled across this, as I said a number of you, I was shocked at that because he is essentially saying, he's talking about the lack of influence Jesus has over Christians, over people like you and me. In other words, he is saying that Muslims demonstrate greater commitment to the teachings of Muhammad than Christians do to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now let that sink in for a minute. I was astounded. Now whether we agree with him or not really is irrelevant. That he even suggests it 
is reason to pause and reflect, and it's a powerful reminder, I think, that people are watching us. If you're a card-carrying Christian, it's a powerful reminder that people are watching us and taking note of how we live as people who claim to be followers of Jesus. And one of the prime examples that Michael Hart gives to support his claim is the failure of Christians to be influenced by the teaching of Jesus and this particular passage we're looking at tonight. Matthew 5, 38 to 48. This call to radical love. Now just a quick recap, if you've been to this, you'll know the Sermon on the Mount. We've been reminded that as Jesus' followers, we are called to a radical discipleship, uh, to a way that is countercultural. In those beautiful words in the Beatitudes, we saw what it was to be blessed in the Kingdom of God. And it was such a contrast to the way we generally think about being blessed in the world today. He talked about poor in spirit and mourning over sin, you'll recall. And then after that, Jesus moved on to talk about how we needed to be distinct as salt and light in the world. And that distinctiveness is no more clearly evident than we, when we demonstrate a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which Andy talked, introduced us to that last week. He talked about four examples concerning murder and adultery, divorce and the giving of oaths. Now in each of these examples, Jesus highlighted that the Pharisees sought to minimise the extent of the law whilst Jesus is trying to broaden it and its application. The Pharisees are reductionists. All they're worried about is the letter of the law, about legalism. And we saw that Jesus is concerned about the spirit of the law and it all being a matter of the heart in how we obey. Well, today we come to the two final examples. And again, we are reminded that the way of Christ is so radical uh, that if we actually live it out, people will admire us, I think, on the one hand, but on the other, they might think we're completely out of our minds. And John Stott in his commentary said this. Stopped working. Okay. Is it there now? Okay. Yep, there we go. John Stott said this. Nowhere is the sermon more challenging. Nowhere is the distinctiveness of the Christian culture more obvious and nowhere is our need of the power of the Holy Spirit more compelling. That sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? So we better pray before we turn to these verses in Matthew 5. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Lord, thank you again for bringing us together tonight. Uh, We thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. We pray that these words that we're going to be thinking about now, Lord, that by your Spirit you would impress them on our hearts, uh, help us to wrestle with them, convict us of their truth, And please show us how we need to apply it and put it into practice. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've become convinced in recent times that there is a part of me that takes great delight in revenge. And I'm reminded of that usually when I'm watching a movie and it's drawing me in, I'm getting really excited about it, and then I realise it's all about revenge and getting other people. And it usually involves lots of guns and blood and shooting and that sort of thing Uh, and I'm ashamed to admit it but it just gets me in now over the years some of my favorite movies I don't know if you can see the pictures up on the screen there Uh, death race anyone seen that guess what that's about yeah death yeah great now the Count of Monte Cristo it's a well-known novel but there's a really good movie about it but it really is uh, a paying back Uh, shooter well guess what that's about killing people Getting back at people uh, and Taken, well, you know, Liam Neeson, there's a whole series of these Taken movies. They're pretty brutal as well. Now, I'm surprised at how much I enjoy, actually, a good revenge uh, movie when the bad guys really, really get whacked in the end. I'm a clergyman. I shouldn't be like that, should I? But then I read these words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and they've convicted me as to maybe I shouldn't get quite so excited about revenge. Because there is a very fine line between justice, which is, we all want, to, we want justice, but there's a fine line between that and revenge. And Jesus says this, he said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away 
from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now there's that phrase there, which I think gets really bad press in the Old Testament, that injunction, an eye on eye for a tooth for a tooth. And people call, talk about it being barbaric and how could you ever you know, live that way? But they actually fail to understand the context and that our own system of law has these very principles built into it. I don't know if you realise that. The instruction, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was given to the judges of Israel to guide them in the handling of legal cases back in the Old Testament there. And it had a double effect, on the one hand of defining justice, but then on the other hand of restraining revenge. On the one hand, it defined the punishment which the wrongdoer deserved, but then it limited the compensation a victim could expect. But you see, the problem was that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law once again misused and misapplied God's law. They took this principle, which was intended to be used in the court of law setting, and they then applied it to a personal relationships as a way of justifying revenge and paying people back in personal vendetta. Jesus once again raises the stakes in terms of our personal relationships. He says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Now Jesus then goes on to give four simple illustrations to make the point here. Each is drawn from a very common practice at that time. Each is of someone trying to take advantage unfairly of another person. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about them in detail, I, I'll give you a little summary here, you can see it on the screen, I think it's in the service notes as well. Uh, but each invo- one, the first one involves a physical threat, the idea of turn the other cheek and get hit again. Another is a legal threat where someone is suing you unfairly. Then there's a social threat, if you like, being forced to go that extra mile. And then one finally, there's a financial threat concerning the borrowing of money. All were very common sort of abuses, if you like, in Jesus' day. Now, over the years, many people have thrown their hands up in the air saying, this teaching's just too difficult. It really is ridiculous. Or if they don't say that, they seem to sort of want to water it down or qualify it so that we really don't have to put it into practice at all. I mean, come on, turn the other cheek, really? You sure we're going to do that? Come on. Surely that's not what Jesus is saying. Well, let's be clear about what Jesus is not saying here. He is not saying that we Christians are meant to be the doormats of the world in which the world wipes their feet on us at any time. And he's not encouraging open season on Christians. He's not saying that we should extend an invitation for people to come and abuse us. Yeah, come on, let's have it. That's not what he's saying either. What Jesus is exhorting his followers to do is to resist every conceivable form of retaliation. He's saying we need to extend grace and not to seek revenge. One commentator put it like this, Jesus' purpose was to forbid revenge, not to encourage injustice, dishonesty or vice. He doesn't encourage the irresponsibility which encourages evil to prosper or advance, but the forbearance which renounces revenge. Now, an example from our recent history, no doubt you've all heard of Dr. Martin Luther King, the famous American civil rights activist. He suffered great injustices. If you've ever seen any of the footage or read any of the history of what happened when he was seeking to get, um, you know, equality for African Americans back in the 60s. But he never sought revenge. And after he was assassinated, yes, there was a, a huge funeral for him. And despite all the injustices that he suffered, this is what was said at his funeral. This man had no bitterness in his heart, no rancor in his soul, um, uh, and no revenge in his mind. And he went up and down the length of this world, preaching non-violence and the redemptive power of love. Now, Martin Luther King certainly had his faults, no doubt about it. But he understood the call of Jesus to non-retaliation in the face of injustice. But in the end, he wasn't just following the teaching of Jesus, he was following the example that Jesus himself gave. Look at these wonderful words from 1 Peter. It says, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. 
When reviled, he did not revile in return. When suffering, he did not threaten, but committed himself to the one who judges justly. See, Jesus has called us to a passive non-retaliation. But he then goes even further in regard to our enemies, saying that we need to move towards them, not away from them, in proactive love. Look what he says in these next verses. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So once again, Jesus begins by highlighting the misguided and twisted teaching of the Pharisees. See, they once again narrow the extent of love and the object of love, and I know neighbours spelt incorrect there. The command originally said, love your neighbour as yourself. That's what we find there in the Old Testament. But the Pharisees, by excluding that phrase, as yourself, well, that reduced the degree to which they had to love. And then by adding hating your enemies, they are limiting the object of love or the extent to which you have to love to the type of person. And that amounted to basically not having to love anyone that you didn't like. Well, that's handy, isn't it? That, in a sense, is their definition of your enemies, anyone you didn't like. And again, Jesus' corrective is so unique and so countercultural that our initial response might be even to recoil from it as well. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, I always think, couldn't he have just said something more reasonable like tolerate your enemies or avoid your enemies? Or don't annoy your enemies? Did he have to say, love your enemies? He always nails us, doesn't he? So in this previous injunction, we are told not to retaliate, and we're called to a passive in our response, but here we are called to be proactive, to be intentionally and actively loving our enemies. Now, just in case you're sitting there feeling very comfortable thinking, thank goodness I don't have any enemies. I can forget about this teaching of Jesus. What a relief that is, because it's really hard by the sound of it anyway. Well, who are your enemies? Well, I want to suggest to you enemies come in all shapes and sizes. If we limit the notion of enemies to people we know who will take up a gun and try to shoot us, well then I'm with you, I don't have any enemies either. I don't know of anyone who wants to do that to me, I haven't heard about you either. So yes, we don't have enemies, but that's how you define it. But that's a very narrow definition of an enemy. Our enemies, I want to suggest to you, are those who stand opposed to God and to his son, Jesus Christ. If we are Christians and if we are aligned with Christ, then his enemies are our enemies. Now, on a global scale today, we would probably include Islamic State and Boko Haram and other terrorist groups like that. There's also secular government-type groups who are opposed to Christians and God's people. We'd probably think, yep, they're our enemies. But for us, there's, they're a long way away, aren't they? They're really not impacting our lives by the grace of God. But what about enemies that might be a little bit closer to home for each of us? What about people we work with? Or if you're a student at university or school? Or what about the people who are at your sports club, your golf club or swimming club or whatever club you go to? Any of them fit into this category that may mock you because they know you're a Christian. Or what about the neighbour that simply avoids you now because you dared to mention Jesus three years ago? That sort of thing. Or what about the people who might not ridicule you directly but every time a Christian in the press gets torn down because they're outspoken about some truth, they take great delight in it and reminding of you of it and taking great joy in it. Or what about the people you simply don't like? Anyone come to mind yet? We've all got enemies. But in the end, I want to suggest to you, it doesn't matter so much whether we can specifically identify who our enemies are, because Jesus' injunction to love our neighbours as ourselves is so broad as to include all people, including our enemies. If Jesus' teaching in the parable of the Good Samaritan, I hope you're aware of that parable, is any guide then our neighbour may also be our enemy. It could include people who are different to us in terms of race or religion or status in life. 
But in other words, Jesus in that parable defines for us our neighbour is just about anyone who comes across our path in life. But this exhortation to love is far more than just not retaliating and being passive to, be, to people that we don't like. Jesus says we are to love our enemies. And I know you're all very well educated and you know love is a verb. You have to do something if you're going to love others. It's not something we can just think about. And if we are to succeed, it begins in prayer. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I know we often pray for persecuted Christians around the world and that is a wonderful thing that we do and should keep doing it. But Jesus says, pray for the persecutor. Pray for the agent of evil, for the one who is opposed to you. And we know Jesus did this, didn't he? On the cross, remember his last words? Pretty much his last words, what did he say? He said, Father, go get them. No. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I'm happy to say in my life there have been very few occasions when I've felt the hatred and hostility of others directed very personally at me. But on those rare occasions, I must have to tell you that prayer has been a great transforming experience for me. Without prayer, there is every chance I will hate, I will seek revenge, I will fight back and not love my enemies. And in my experience, it's really hard to hate people that you're praying for. I dare you to try it. That person that's really annoying you at work, start praying for them. It'll transform the way you look at them. Or anyone else you might think you don't like. Because when we pray, it's amazing what happens. We're inviting God into the situation and we're inviting him not only to change the heart of our enemies, but to change ours. Our heart gets changed. And it's amazing what happens when we pray like that because when we pray for our enemies, we start to feel a lot more compassion for them. We see them in a whole different light. We're less judgmental of them. And when we pray, it's easy to see them as people just like us. Broken, sinful, in need of God's transforming grace. See, Jesus' teaching here is clear. We must pray for those whom we feel least like loving. Well, the second thing uh, that Jesus says about the extent of love is that the love uh, we must show is got to be above average. It's got to be actually exceptional. Look what he says there, verse 46. He says, if you love those who love you, well, what reward will that get you? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not pagans even do that? I love Jesus' teaching. It's so in your face, isn't it? And it's so simple. There's no avoiding the point. I mean, tax collectors and pagans, they were shameful people in that society. Everyone knew it. They even knew it. And yet they experienced love. They loved other people in their families and those people loved them. And Jesus' point is so clear, there's little reason to rejoice if we simply love the people who love us. That's what he's saying. We're meant to be better than that. We're meant to do more than that. We're called to a higher standard of love. One commentator said, it is not enough for Christians to resemble non-Christians. Our calling is to outstrip them in virtue. See, so far, Jesus has made some extraordinary demands here of those who are disciples, who are part of his kingdom. He says, if our righteousness is to exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, then we need to heed the call to passive love in non-retaliation. We're to avoid seeking revenge at all costs in our relationship. Well, that's pretty hard, isn't it? But then he goes on further, he says, we're to heed the call to proactive love, in moving towards others, to be intentionally loving those who actually are opposed to us or who would even seek to harm us. And again, Jesus is calling us to recognise that power that there is in redemptive love. Now, if I push the pause button there for a moment and I ask you, well, how are you feeling about all this? Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you say, get real, Michael. This is just too radical. It's over the top. There's no way this is possible. So then you're saying to me, Michael Hart's right then about us Christians. 
I'll come back to him in a minute. But if that's what you're thinking, I want to say to a high degree, I agree with you. In many ways, this teaching of Jesus is overwhelming. But what Jesus is talking about is, if it is humanly impossible, it's only that way because we have an appropriate, this final call that Jesus makes where he says we've got to love like God. That sounds radical too, doesn't it? He says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, that seems really over the top, doesn't it? But elsewhere in the Bible, we've already been given some radical calls. We've been told in the Old Testament and New that God is holy and therefore we are to be holy. That sounds pretty radical. Now to that, Jesus adds with the call to be perfect. But what could he possibly mean when he says we're meant to be perfect here? I remember having a great laugh when I found, I might have been on Facebook or somewhere on social media, someone wrote, look, I'm having a really good day. I don't think I've sinned yet. I haven't sworn. I haven't had a self-righteous or judgmental thought. But shortly I've got to get out of bed and face the world. So I'll let you know how I go after that. That's the problem, isn't it? I'm pretty good between about 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. myself. You know, I'm pretty good. Don't know how you go in those hours. It's the daylight hours that we have trouble with, isn't it? So if it's proven fact, if it's proven fact that you and I, we can't live a single hour, let alone a whole day, in sinless perfection, what on earth is Jesus talking about here when he says, be perfect? Well, I think the context helps us understand it here. Although it is true, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you know we're meant to try and live a life without sin. That's what Jesus calls us to. But here he is calling us to love perfectly, and he qualifies it, as our Heavenly Father does. And our Heavenly Father loves us impartially, without fear or favour. And that's what we're called to. He gives this example, he spells it out in verse 45. God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's true, isn't it? We know that's true. Theologians call this common grace. God sheds his love and mercy on all, not just those who acknowledge that he's a really nice guy and he does a lot of good things for us. No, God showers his grace and love on everyone. His love is impartial and inclusive. And so we are not to love in response to just how people treat us. We are simply to love. That's the call. Full stop. Whether there's something in it for us, whether people have responded to us the way we might have liked, whether they've really appreciated us or acknowledged us for something we've done, we're simply to love because that is the way God loves. That is the way he has loved us, seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember that verse which says, while we were still his enemies... Christ died for us. See, that is kingdom love. That is what Jesus is talking about here for his disciples. Friends, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to love impartially. No favourites. But secondly, we are called to be like Jesus. Not in theory, but in practice. And we are called to imitate him in the way we love. Here's some beautiful verses which I hope you'll be familiar with from Philippians chapter 2. Talking of Jesus, it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Friends, when we love impartially, when we love by imitating the love Jesus has shown us, then we will be honouring the injunction that Jesus gives us here to be perfect, just as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Well, it still amazes me that anyone could dare to suggest that someone other than Jesus Christ is the most influential person in history. But Michael Hart, in defending that decision not to put Jesus first, had this to say in respect of these verses we've just considered. Here's what he said in his book. These are surely among the most remarkable and original ethical ideas ever presented. If they were widely followed, I would have no hesitation in placing Jesus 
first in this book. But the truth is that they are not widely followed. Most Christians consider the injunction to love your enemies as at most an ideal which might be realised in some perfect world but one which is not a reasonable guide to conduct in actual world we live in. Jesus' most distinctive teaching, therefore, remains an intriguing but basically untried suggestion. Now, we don't have to agree with him, and I think he's wrong, but if there's a perception of like that, then perception's reality, isn't it? that the same? And so I think he's right in that sense. And so the challenge remains that we might live out the radical discipleship that we've been called to demonstrate in the countercultural kingdom of love that Jesus is building. We're called to turn the other cheek. That we might not retaliate and seek revenge. That we might love actively even our enemies and to start by praying for them. To be like Jesus being imitators of God being people who let our love flow graciously, impartially to both the righteous and the unrighteous. So Jesus calls us to this radical discipleship in his counter-cultural kingdom and he calls us to live in such a way that we demonstrate that redemptive power of love that he brought and showed to us and we can have that experience in our relationships with him and so he wants us to demonstrate it to others. Now, can I say, please don't think that I think this is easy. When has Jesus' teaching ever been easy? But it is a high calling, and we can't ignore it or try to water it down. But in our own strength, we we simply cannot love like this. It's not possible. But as people who have been declared righteous through our faith in Christ, we are called to live this righteous life. And we can only do that with three things going on, I think. With our eyes on the cross, with our minds being transformed by the Word of God, and with our hearts empowered by the Holy Spirit. Eyes, minds and hearts. Friends, the world is watching us, believe it or not. They are taking note. And I believe we can show the world that this is not some idealistic dream that Jesus is talking about, but it can be a living reality when we allow God's word and his spirit to empower us to obey these words. An old hymn says, Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Isn't that the truth? It surely is. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we again thank you for these words of our Saviour. We recognise, Lord, they are challenging, but we also recognise that your words are life and truth. And we know, Lord, that as we live them out, we are blessed. So please, Lord, help us to wrestle with these words. Please show us uh, people we should be praying for that we know we don't like or who might even be opposed to us, so that we might indeed put these words into practice and that we we would love others, perhaps in ways we've never loved before, and that we might show them that it's all because of Christ who lives in us. And we pray in his powerful name. Amen. Despised 
Yes, sir. 